Hello, First Lady Keller. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much for having us. And I just wanted to start off by um, thanking a ton of the folks who have made this possible. I think like most incredible things, right, this has taken a whole village. So wanted to start off by thanking Bookworks for putting on this event. Wanted to thank UNM Press and the National Hispanic Cultural Center for all of their partnership on this project. Want to thank the team at the city of Albuquerque's Department of Arts and Culture, um, who has helped sponsor the amazing Poet Laureate project and for the entire Poet Laureate uh, Project Committee, who work so hard each year to help select the Poet Laureate for the city of Albuquerque, and then to help support them as well on their journey. Um, but most of all, just wanted to thank really our guest of honor today and Michelle Otero for these incredible poems and this incredible year of service, right, that's embodied in some of these poems. Uh, it's been amazing to me to sit down over the last couple of years and read through this just incredible work of art as we were uh, sharing before um, it both reminds me sort of since the pandemic started our family has spent a ton of time in the bosky sort of walks at the beginning of the day in the afternoon and to pick up this book that is both so rooted in the natural habitat but also so rooted in the people and community and cultures that I think lots of us are missing right sort of a gathering in person it really carried home how important and powerful it is to have this collection of works in book form to accompany and cap off just an incredible year of service and, and all of the art and dedication and work that Michelle poured into our community. Uh, to be able to then share those works with folks who may not have been there the first time to hear her read some of them out loud or who were there and can pick them up over and over and over again to celebrate the events where they were shared and the depth of the meaning she's able to convey Bay. So we just want to thank you again, Michelle, for this work and to thank everybody who has made this possible. We are so excited that this publication will become a regular part of the Poet Laureate program and appreciate everything you all are doing to, to uplift um, the writers, the artists, and all of these incredible folks in our community. So thank you. All right, thank you so much. I think we lost your video there, but we were still able to hear you. All right, thank you so much, Michelle, for your hard work as Poet Laureate. I know those bosque walks were a lot of fun. People enjoyed those. All of our Poet Laureates here in Albuquerque have done wonderful work. Um, just wanna give a few shout outs to those folks. Our inaugural Poet Laureate, Hakeem Bellamy. Then we had our Radical Feminist Poet Laureate, Jessica Helen Lopez. On to Manuel Gonzalez, who we are hosting next Sunday for his book of poems. Very excited about that. Then we had Michelle Otero here today. And now our Poet Laureate is Mary Oishi, who is also on the call. So we're very pleased to have her here with us. And we are celebrating once again having a wonderful Poet Laureate to represent Albuquerque poetry. All right, so let's launch into this. Valerie Martinez, thank you so much for this partnership. This has been so fun to do these virtual events with you. Um, you're always super prepared and ask wonderful questions. And so I love turning it over to you right now to talk to Michelle and Bryce. Thanks, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Valerie Martinez and I'm the Director of History and Literary Arts at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. I'm so happy that you're all here. I can't see all of your faces right now, but I'm imagining all of them here to support Michelle in this event. I'm especially grateful that the NHCC is able to present this afternoon's reading with a group of wonderful event partners, Bookworks, UNM Press, the City of Albuquerque and the Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program. The History and Literary Arts Program at the NHCC is dedicated to celebrating literary works by Hispanic Latinx writers. These promote a deeper understanding of Latinx culture, identity, and heritage, some of the goals of the NHCC overall. The Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program is now in its 10th year, having recently named its fifth laureate, Mary, who's with us. The city of Albuquerque, with thanks to Mayor Keller and Shel Sanchez, Director of Cultural Services, 
has in the last few years generously funded the Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program by providing a stipend for each laureate and this year supporting the UNM Press book series that Bryce will talk about in a moment. When these efforts work in partnership with the ever wonderful Bookworks and UNM Press, we get what I consider to be truly meaningful programming, and I'm really honored to be part of it. In a moment, I'm going to introduce Michelle and her wonderful new book, but first I want to ask Bryce Emily from UNM Press to say a few words about the Poet Laureate book series. Bryce? Well, um, I wanted to start by uh, really shouting out the mayor's office in the city of Albuquerque because it's uh, it's easy to overlook how, how generous and valuable a program like this is to have city poet laureates. Um, and I think it's a really special program and UNM Press plays a very small part in that by publishing books by these poets now, but um, dedicating resources and time and, and uh, uh, money and countless meetings, I'm sure, to getting these programs up and running and facilitating them is, is really amazing. So I'm really proud that we're able to be a part of it, um, even a small part. So we'll be publish publishing two books a season for the next two seasons um, from these Poets Laureate. Uh, this season, Michelle Otero and Manuel Gonzalez, who, as Amanda said, will be reading next week, uh, next Sunday. And in the fall, we'll be publishing Hakeem Bellamy's and Jessica Helen Lopez's books. And um, also in partnership with the NHCC, we'll have uh, three more events coming up soon. Um, Manuel's as previously mentioned. And then um, we'll have Craig Harris, author with Max Baca of Crossing Borders, uh, which is... Um, sort of Max Baca's music autobiography and uh, Richard Shirley and, um, or Richard Flint and Shirley Cushing Flint um, will be reading from Overhaul May 16th and that Craig Harris event is May 2nd. But um, so those are, those are in partnership with the NHCC. And uh, again, I'm really, really grateful to be able to have partnerships with organizations like VAL and, and, and the NHCC um, as the events coordinator at the University of New Mexico Press. Those are, partnerships I really value. And I, I think that we should all uh, do as much as we can for our community and our cultural organizations to uplift each other and to bring programs like this to the public. So thank you all for being here and uh, for, for making this a success and for, um, for continuing to read these poets and, and listen to them. Um, this, is, uh, this is what publishing and, and the poets are all about. So uh, thanks everybody. Great, thanks Bryce. So um, the program today is going to consist of Michelle reading from the book several times with some conversation between the two of us between, followed by Q&A at the end. So if along the way you uh, think of questions or comments, please jot them down or take a note of them. And when we open up the Q&A later, you can put them in the chat and we'll ask Michelle to, to respond. So let me start by telling you something about Michelle. Michelle Otero was Albuquerque's Poet Laureate from 2018 to 2020. Her signature projects were writing walks along the Rio Grande Bosque in the spirit of caring for, honoring, documenting, and conserving this sacred and endangered place, and writing alone together, a once a month event where people could find a quiet, safe place to create together. Among other events, she coordinated a really beautiful and very moving candlelight public vigil after the El Paso shooting in which 22 or 24 poets read poems with a sense of both great loss as well as love for that community. In addition, she appeared at dozens of public events reading poems for a wide range of occasions, some of which you will hear today. Michelle is a writer, facilitator, mentor, and coach who utilizes creative expression and storytelling as the basis for organizational development and positive social change. Her process of engaging individuals and communities through the expression of shared story has found a wide range of applications, from helping conservation organizations better understand the priorities of traditional land-based communities to helping people heal from trauma. Michelle's consulting practice is called artesana, combining the Spanish words for art and healing. 
Michelle is the author of Bosque, a debut book of poems written during her tenure as poet laureate and the book she'll read from today, and Malinche's Daughter, an essay collection based on her work as a Fulbright Fellow with women survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault in Oaxaca, Mexico. She is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop, a founding member of the Tiaso Artist Cooperative, and Embras de Pluma, an indigenous and women of color theater group. Michelle is originally from Deming. She holds Deming, New Mexico, I should say. She holds a BA in history from Harvard and an MFA in creative writing from Vermont College. And she lives in the South Valley. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Val. Um, thank you, everyone. I can see your messages in the chat and um, see you as you're coming in. And I'm just, um, there are so many people to thank, so I'm gonna do a little bit of thanking as I go along the way um, and a little bit of reading. And, and as Valerie said, we'll be in conversation. Uh, so I'd like to first just um, start off by thanking all the folks who made this particular event possible. So Valerie Martinez and the um, History and Literary Arts Department at the Hispanic Cultural Center. Um, they don't only hold space for these events, but for, um, you know, they've revived the National Latinx Writers Gathering, they host tertulias, and they've con continued this really robust programming, even through the pandemic, um, and especially through the pandemic. Um, also, Amanda Sutton and the folks at BookWorks, um, that place is such a deep, you know, there are poets and writers in Albuquerque and readers who have such deep love for book works. And it's really so good to see that it's still here and we're still supporting it. And let's just continue to do so. So if you haven't bought the book or if you haven't bought any books in a while, buy them from Bookworks. Um, they have wonderful curbside pickup and they ship. And uh, we really need to take care of our local bookstores uh, because let's face it, Amazon's not gonna do this for us. <laughs> so um, I'd really like to thank UNM Press, all the folks there, Elise McHugh, Bryce Emley, um, Stephen Hall. Um, it's just been a joy to work with them. Um, they really, they take care of their writers and um, it's been such a wonderful collaboration back and forth. And it's nice to see it all come together in this space. And then finally, uh, Mayor Tim Keller and First Lady Liz Kiston Keller, um, all the ways that you support poetry and artists in this community. And then Shel Sanchez and the Department of Cultural Services at the city of Albuquerque. We're so lucky to have um, a poet laureate program here um, that really nurtures and supports poets and writers. Um, okay. And now to some poetry. All right, here we go, Bosque. <laughs> so um, I'll read a few poems and then Valerie and I will chat for a moment and uh, then I'll read a few more. The Color Brown, and this goes out to Nadia in New York who read this out loud even though she's not yet in kindergarten and texted me to say she really likes this poem. <laughs> so The Color Brown, Coyote Fence, Backyard Dirt, January yucca frond, estancia pintos, arroyo sand, sun cracked gourd, cottonwood trunk, husk, dust, mesquite pod, dirt road, river clay, adobe brick, Taos church, mother's hands, me. Water. We tell the children tales of thunderstorms. Each May, we drop rose petals into trickling acequia, invoke San Isidro for good harvest, good rain, pray these petals seed clouds. We remember summers of fire, haze over mesa, sunset behind a scrim of smoke, torches in the gemes, torches in the sangres, kindling night roads from Santa Fe to Santo Domingo. What if it never rains again? What if it never rains? Again, rain. We remember Isla Rafiste, hide drum, dancers pray with their feet. One chin, then another turns to sky. Two gold eagles circle conjuring clouds. One drop, then another. Stillness, except the drum, the dance, the rain. Sunday morning, we cross Central Bridge on foot, called by the same spirit drawing hiking boots, cowboy hats, hard creased dickies, running shorts, pigtails, plastic rosary hanging from walker, nose rings, Oakland Raiders tattoos. We stand in silence on the banks of the Rio Grande, pilgrims no less awestruck than John the Baptist converts, 
for the miracle of a river at its highest point in 40 years. For a moment, we forget our thirst. Um, this next poem, uh, so when you are the poet laureate for um, a community that really invites poetry into many places like Albuquerque, um, you get invited to create, um, to, to read poems at all sorts of occasions. And um, throughout my time as poet laureate, I really wanted to um, create a poem that was an offering back to a particular community. And one of, um, I think my greatest honors during that time was being invited by uh, by Representative Deb Holland to read a poem at her local swearing in. And um, I know she's been in confirmation hearings um, this past week, and it just felt important to um, send our energy to her and just to mark how monumental it is to have a Pueblo woman as um, a US Congresswoman and potentially as the um, Secretary of the Department of the Interior. Um, so this poem is for Deb Holland and um, the reference to Soma, uh, Soma is her daughter. <clears throat> you run at sunrise, mother next to you, father in your heart, Soma in a ribbon shirt, her compass tattoo points home. At sunrise, you leave the ladder down. Other girls will climb over walls, shatter ceilings, bore into earth and back again. You run a marathon one day at a time. The sun rises on Laguna Kawaike in the foothills of Mount Taylor, red, yellow, orange, seed pot made of mud, story made of light. You take a breath, hold space with a blanket, wipe our tears on sister's scarf. The sun rises even on Congress, on Thobe, moccasins, hijab, and hoops. With mother next to you, Soma's compass made of mud, made of light, we know where home is. We know our place in the universe, our right to existence. You run, we run with you. We walk together, we take a breath at sunrise. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> So one of the questions I have for you is for everybody, if you haven't gotten the book, but you all should order it right now, it's full of occasional poems. And I wanted to ask you about the particular challenge of that because the beauty of occasional poems is they are the poet's service. Usually poets, we don't have to write for occasions. We write for an audience maybe, but for ourselves. And you wrote so many for these particular events. So could you talk a little bit about what was great and maybe what was challenging about that? Yeah, um, so I think what was great about it is that, you know, no matter how much you write, you always, um, you always start off, even when you have a book, when you go to write something new, you start off with this. <laughs> like you just, you end up looking at a blank page. And um, I think that can be really intimidating. And so what was helpful about occasion poems or being able to create something like for the Creative Bravos, for example, which is a, an award um, awarded by the um, Department of uh, Cultural Services here in Albuquerque to artists who are who create art in service of community, um, <clears throat> was being able to go into all of their stories. And uh, so it was almost like, um, it was, it was like doing research, like figuring out, um, you know, oh, this particular poet is being honored. Oh, well, what has she done? Um, being able to read her work, to see all the ways that she had contributed to community. So it was, um, it was a way of really learning more about Albuquerque, um, being able to look into these corners where maybe I, I wasn't as familiar with it as, a, as on a you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, and then um, being able to kind of take that back and offer it. And, um, and I think just like today, there's this idea that the, the reader or the listener or the audience completes the process. Um, so in that sense, you could, um, you know, I'm, I'm creating a poem based on people's stories and I haven't necessarily met them. And then when I get to go and offer that poem back, um, it's really moving to to see um, to see folks receive those words and to know like oh that that actually meant something to them. It was um, um, it was a really beautiful exchange, um, and I think some.
something that was might have been challenging is when I didn't know anything <laughs> about a particular thing. So I think an example is these um, the library awards at um, at University of New Mexico. So I might be the only one, the only poet I know who has CRISPR and nanotechnology <laughs> in a poem. Uh, but that came exactly from the work that um, one of the you know one of the award recipients was doing. She was in a lab studying CRISPR technology, and that's where I got to learn about oh well wow, gene editing. I can't believe this is happening here. And um, and I think she was really surprised, like, oh, I can't believe you wrote about CRISPR <laughs> in your poem. Um, yeah, so so it, it, the challenge was always like a fun one, like how, how can I write about CRISPR or nanotechnology or somebody's research on brothels? Um, you know, I have brothels and CRISPR in the same poem, <laughs> which I don't think would have happened without without the occasion to write occasion poems. I love this idea of creating community by writing the poem, what you've just described, is you weave in people, you know, Burkeans and others into the poems. And so that's unusual. That doesn't always happen when we write for ourselves, so to speak. So I think that's a really lovely way of the writing being an active community. So that I think that's beautiful. Thanks. You want to read some more? Yeah, I'll read some more. Um, okay, so this one is a, um, we'll hear some repetition in this one because it is a pontoon. All right, and um, actually Val, the first draft of this I wrote in your workshop. <laughs> so, um, Valerie, in addition to being a wonderful poet and uh, the director of history and literary arts is also a wonderful um, teacher. Okay. Um, this is called My Mother Was Never a Housewife, and uh, this is written after Andrew Burnside's uh, painting, Succulents. I've killed every jade plant. Neglect is hardest to master. In the compost, root ball shrivels, black and black. The last jade in a pot belonging to grandmother. Neglect is hardest to master. Instructions, withhold water as with love. The last jade in a pot belonging to grandmother. She of the Kent 3100s tended rubber tree and jalapeno. She instructed, withhold water, showed us to parcel love until leaves droop and trunk is hard to the touch. She of the Kent 3100s tended rubber tree and jalapeno. Her love was smoke, rolling pin, burnt tortillas. Until leaves droop and trunk is hard to the touch, succulents will lean toward the sun. Her love was smoke, rolling pin, burnt tortillas. My mother, her eldest, was never a housewife. Succulents will lean toward the sun. It's likely your indoor greenery will find you when you are least prepared. My mother, the oldest, was never a housewife. As a child, I offered my hands, she said, you can help best by staying out of the way. Your indoor greenery will find you when you are least prepared. Dirt from your yard won't do. I offer my hands. She says, you can help best by staying out of the way. Powdery live forever takes decades to mature and resembles a lotus flower. Dirt from your yard won't do. There is a black market for succulents, crush of Korean and Chinese housewives. Powdery live forever takes decades to mature and resembles a lotus flower. Lotus, Hindu symbol of fertility. There's a black market for succulents, crush of Korean and Chinese housewives. Separated from their cliff sides, most plants don't survive the journey. Lotus, Hindu symbol of fertility. So much of aging is about moisture or its lack. Separated from their cliff sides, most plants don't survive the journey. I had a teacher who collected objects, forest rocks and petrified wood. So much of aging is about moisture or its lack. Like chopping the hand of a beloved and keeping it to remember her. I had a teacher who collected objects, forest rocks and petrified wood. The current stand of middle Rio Grande cottonwoods is nearing the end like chopping the hand of a beloved and keeping it to remember her. In the desert, every living thing asks for water. 
the current stand of middle Rio Grande cottonwoods is nearing the end. I've killed every jade plant. Desert things ask for water. In the compost, root ball shrivels, black and black. Um, so I'm going to drop in a few more thank yous. I really want to thank Stephen St. John for this gorgeous image on the cover. Um, if you don't know his work, follow him on Instagram, um, Stephen St. John. He just is a wonderful photographer and, um, and available to photograph many things. <laughs> so uh, he's very generous to uh, to lend his work to this book. And he also coincidentally photographed our wedding. So it was nice to have him here for this event as well. Um, <clears throat> water, here water gives, water takes. Paraje, los arboles, San Rafael, flooded, burned, buried for reservoirs and dams. Water controlled, water contained. Salt cedar, Siberian elm, Russian olive, stem the Rio Grande, root deep as though they belong. Seed packet for dry land. Wrap in old rags, plant after last freeze, shoulder deep in dark soil. Drop water to survive dry times. How to measure sunlight, how to thrive when late rain, no rain, elk raid, frost. You know this. Everything breaks to become what it is. You know this. It is all dry land. When time comes winnow, grind into coarse flour, take to river where we are enough. And do one more and then we can talk again, Val. <laughs> um, so this one's um, a little bit funny and a, a true story. So where the border isn't a metaphor. A poet on my Borderlands panel says when he was a boy, he thought the lines dividing countries were real, thought he could touch them if he crossed one side to the next. I think of my older brother who as kids told me the stars pinning capital cities to maps were visible from airplanes. That's how they know where to land. He said the lines between states were dotted so we could drive across them. The lines between countries were solid. We needed permission to cross. That's why there were guards. From the kitchen, my mom, lesson plans and first grade writing sheets fanned around her, called out, stop telling her those things, she believes you. We were born north of that line dividing New Mexico from her older sister, the one who just couldn't get it together. Where customs asked each time we crossed back from the dentist, the pink store, the eye doctor, the pharmacy for penicillin without a prescription, US citizens? On the Borderlands panel, the poet invites me to enter the borderless realm of my imagination. I recall junior year when our wildcat marching band paraded the maid road of Palomas. I played a trumpet solo, America the Beautiful, while school kids in green uniforms waved Mexican and American flags. The governors of Chihuahua and New Mexico shook hands to launch a surveillance blimp to help the border patrol catch drug runners and smugglers and people who looked like us. We were served lunch in a dance hall with high ceilings and dusty light from open barn doors. We ate carne asada and drank Coca-Cola from bottles. I said gracias when a girl my age picked up my empty plate, my only Spanish. My parents didn't teach us, didn't want anyone mistaking us for Mexican. There have always been walls. Consider the bobcat, Chihuahuan desert split in half. Ask my brother and me in English so we understand. Thanks, Michelle. I love that poem. That's one of my favorites in the whole book. Oh, thank you, Val. <laughs> I should also give a shout out to my brothers and thank them by my brothers for content. <laughs> so, so much inspiration. <laughs> so I think all four of them are here um, and as well as my parents who I just really want to thank them for always um, believing in me and all their support. And giving you the stories, I think that giving me the story. 
<laughs> I think my mom was always saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I was young and my dad was driving and on the highway. For some reason, I thought that the exit sucked you off the highway. And I thought my dad was an amazing driver because he could hold on to the wheel so he wouldn't get sucked off the edge. But it leads me to this question. There's a few impulses in this poem. And one of them is storytelling, like the story that you just told. And some of the others are listing and repetition. And so many of the poems are sort of incantatory incantations. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. In some of those poems, you're telling stories as well. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about repetition and how it enters the poems. And then I have a storytelling question too. Okay. Um, so I think with repetition, I just, um, I think with poetry rather than prose, right? With, um, I, I remember um, being so lucky my first, uh, my first year at the Macondo Writers Workshop, um, we weren't supposed to be in Sandra Cisneros's workshop, but I just listed that I wanted to be in hers and got put in. <laughs> so, and she was kind of like, How did, you're not supposed to be in here. <laughs> and I think a few of us first years snuck in. And I remember her talking about like just the unit of measurement in a poem. And she's like, I don't, you're not, it's not even the line, it's the syllable. And, and I just always remember that when I'm thinking of, um, when I'm thinking of creating a poem. So in, sometimes it's not even so much the, um, like the word itself or the image that I, that I start with. It's more like just thinking about a particular word. Um, like in, in that last poem that I read, it was thinking about, oh, bobcat, like bobcat split in half, like thinking of that A sound and, and thinking of these animals on either side of this wall, um, even though there's not a lot of repetition <laughs> in that poem. Um, and then I think with other things, um, it, maybe some of it is just even, um, I, it sounds a little bit big, but growing up Catholic even, and like the, the, the ritual and uh, the repetition of prayers and how just even that act of like moving your fingers across rosary beads, like there was a lot in my life that was about repetition, even though I wasn't really aware of it. Right. I, I also grew up in a house with a lot of music. So uh, my brothers are musicians and, you know, and my parents had like two trombones, a saxophone, a trumpet and a drum set. <laughs> so there was just one of my brothers would always kind of tap at the table. So there was just kind of always a rhythm and a music. And I think it, it, it just it's, it's how it's it's the music that I work with now. Like, right. Like just thinking about. Um, okay, I need a two syllable word here. How does it sound? How does it feel in my mouth as I'm reading it? And I know that if I trip over something, it's not the, it's not the right word. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think that so speaks strong, a little bit. Yeah, sense of music. And I think the repetition is, it propels us through the poem. And it's also very, it seems to me also elemental in the sense that I was with my godson yesterday and you know how with babies, he's almost one, you just repeat the same gestures over and over again and you know just to make them laugh or something it seems to me that repetition is somehow elemental in our experience somehow and also like you said like accounting like the rosary and maybe incantation comes from that and that's really powerful in this book there's lots of poems there's also sort of recipe poems which kind of do the same thing do this and then do this and then do this mm -hmm. also really powerful yeah so my storytelling question before you read again is, so in the poems that you're talking about, the occasional, you name people that maybe you don't know, but the book is also full of people you know, you know, familial um, and, and their hands and their feet and family. And so I wanted to ask you if you could talk about your writing process a little and how are you just remembering or how do these people that you love in your family enter the poems or do you think of it first or how does it happen? Um, yeah, I, I think as you were saying that, I, I, think I'll, I think I'll spend the rest of my life just figuring out how to write about my grandma Rosie's hands. Like, I, and I don't even know, I don't think she's in this book actually, like she's in my memoir a little bit, but I remember she had this um, beauty mark and it almost, I just almost remember it was like a, it was almost like a little pin, like kind of like holding her skin together. And she was just, um, just always making tortillas, like always feeding people. Um, and 
Right. I think, yeah, I think I could spend the rest of my life just talking about like what the women and men in my family have done with their hands um, and how, how much work they've created, um, especially, you know, I think about like my maternal grandfather and how he couldn't do, um, you know, just because of his mental health after World War II, there was just a lot, like he would, he went on disability, right? But he was still a mechanic. So you could call him and say, oh, my car is making this like, and he'd be like, oh, it's the carburetor. <laughs> he could like diagnose it um, over the phone. And, and um, <clears throat> I feel like I just have this treasure trove, right? And, and same thing like with my dad, my dad, um, I, I remember saying one day, like, I can't find a rolling pin anywhere. Like, I feel like everyone has a rolling pin, but no one sells them. Like, where do you get a rolling pin? And, and then my dad kind of disappeared for a while. My mom and I were still talking and he came back in and he had given me a rolling pin. <laughs> he just went into the garage and made one. And, um, and so I just, there's so many like little stories like that. And, and, um, and I think they've become more important. Like I, you know, we, we're not a family that has kind of kept a lot or passes on a lot of like material things. Um, but, and, and I think, especially for me, I, you know, I think we share this experience about we've both lost things in a fire. Right. So I, I lost, I lost everything. I lost my apartment in a fire in 2009. And, um, and I just remember that time as being like, Oh, like, just, oh, I, I, there's a lot that I don't have anymore. And, and what really kind of filled my life in that time was just remembering. It's like, okay, I don't have, um, I don't have that Polaroid anymore, or I don't, I don't have my journal. So I don't have, I don't have my, like my 20 year old voice trying to sound really smart <laughs> in my journal, but, but I remember her, like, I remember that girl with like really self-consciously writing in her journal, wondering, um, if somebody was ever going to find it and would they think I was smart. Um, so it's almost, um, I can't remember who said this, but it's like we only store memories of value and, um, and more and more, it's almost like a, just a, a box of like of buttons or like broken jewelry or something where it's a, a little bit incomplete or, um, but I, I can just go to that, even if it's metaphorical now, just go to that. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about this. Oh yeah. That like, I don't know, that bleach stain on the carpet in my room when I was a kid, because my, you know, my brother poured Tylex on it. Like, <laughs> or, you know, just all of these little things. And um, and I think the, the wonderful thing now about just make creating poetry on purpose, which I which I didn't always do, it was more like I would write a lot of prose with line breaks, um, is, is now there's just a whole other avenue. Like it's almost like learning another language, right? So if there is a memory, I'm like, oh, that doesn't quite work in, a, in an essay, um, but that would totally work in a poem, or maybe that belongs in a short story. So it's just these, like figuring out how these stories wanna be, wanna be told. Like, like I could stop having new stories and still have plenty to write about for the rest of my life. Oh, <laughs> Read us some more. All right, thanks for that question. Um, okay, all right, and more people to thank <laughs> before. So I really wanna thank the Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program Organizing Committee. Um, so Val's part of that as well. It's a wonderful group of people and um, just um, just having folks who kind of like hold the program has, has been, um, it was really wonderful during my time as Poet Laureate because it was like, oh, I don't have to do everything. Somebody's got my back. Like, they're going to give me some schema. <laughs> was good. Um, I want to thank all the poets who hosted Poetry Walks in the Bosque. I know many of you are here and some of the poems in this collection came directly from those walks. Um, and then my fellow Poets Laureate, um, um, all my friends, I have many groups of very close friends, which is why there were like over 200 people at my wedding. <laughs> and, and I know many of those groups are here. So the Belize women, um, the Embras, Las Creativas, um, the U, um, my CSA friends. Um, yeah, Los Desnudos. So just thank you all. And, and many friends that I just, um, the Mega Nenas, I, um, so appreciative of all of you. And I want to give a shout out to my hometown of Deming, New Mexico, um, which I got to say, like growing up right around 16, I never thought I would give Deming a shout out, but I'm um, just really thankful for um, that I was raised in a small town, that my parents still live there, um, and that 
you've shown so much support, especially as this book has gone out into the world. And two of Albuquerque's five poets laureate are Deming High School graduates, so Jessica and me. So that's cool too. Okay, and now to read, here we go. Um, this one's untitled, it's very short. What is the cure for sand in the throat? Ask the river. Sestina Azteca. So Sestina is another form poem. And um, I cheated a little because I'm using Spanish and Nahuatl as well as English, but can listen for these end words. Story, plume, stain, ground, speak, coyote. Sestina Azteca. I don't know if I buy that story about the Aztecs mistaking Cortez for the plume serpent Quetzalcoatl. What with the stain of conquest ground into his beard, how he couldn't speak Nahuatl, he was the first Spanish blood coyote in the new world. Not the canine coyotl, but trickster story spinner speaking through Malinche, plumed tongue from her lips to Moctezuma's ears. Ground corn passed around their circle, an offering. Scribes, their fingers stained red and black, captured this history on the mate bark. Stains like coffee woven through its fibers, texture of coyote pelt. Scribes sat on the ground, Moctezuma on his throne, telling the story of his people. We come from the center of the earth. We plume the dead who turn to hummingbirds. I am Tlatuani, he who speaks for his people. They were beautiful, market prostitute with red stained teeth, acupuncturist with turkey feathers and fish spines, warriors, coyote slender and swift. We know this story, what happens to Tenochtitlan, how it all sinks into the ground. Today, her descendants grind teeth and bone, speak incomplete stories. We think we know Mexico, policia y politicos with stained hands, migrants pressed atop la bestia, coyote prey. Only feathered beasts fly the border. The rest snatched from their children by a president's plume. The ancestor said, yell into the ground, give it the tlasolteotl. Like coyote, she walks on all fours. She speaks once a year, eats humanity's filth, our stains. That's a story I can believe. Not a plumed serpent made man who spoke siege, who walked sacred ground and saw only the stain of sin, but coyote woman who eats the worst of us and spits a new story. I have one more little tiny one, um, but I just want to, again, just thank um, family. So my ancestors, um, my parents and my siblings and my extended family. So all my in-laws, my nieces and nephews, um, my chosen family. Um, so my, um, I want to really thank Henry, my husband and uh, Paloma and Kiki my stepkids and, um, and then my just extended family of aunts, uncles, and then those fam family members of the heart. So I'm so grateful that you all are here. Um, and I wanna thank the Bosque too, like how lucky are we? So if you haven't gone out there, just go. <laughs> Spend some time there. It's, this, it's the heart of our city and, um, and we really need it. And I think a lot of us had recognized that through the pandemic, um, so. Here's the, the last poem of the collection. Water, this is New Mexico. Here life walks in circles. In drought, we the people look to the skies, put a hand to the ground. In drought, we the people are water. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <Hey. laughs> So we're going to open up the chat now for your questions and comments. But as that's happening, Michelle, I wanted to just um, because the title of your book is Bosque and you chose the Bosque for really kind of the focus of your laureateship. If you could just if there's anything you want to say about that before we answer questions, you know um, what that means to you or why you really made that the emphasis of your work. Yeah, um, so thanks for that. So I grew up in a part of the state where um, there was like all the vegetation had been removed from along the river. Um, and it just never even occurred to me that you could have 
a river one with water in it because <laughs> there were always huge sandbars as we would cross the Rio Grande to get from, uh, we would take I-10 from Deming into Las Cruces, the big city, <laughs> to do our school shopping. And, um, and I just remember there was hardly ever any water in the river and then just all the vegetation was flat. It was just um, very dry. And um, it wasn't until I came here that I realized like that was because of modification, right? It was um, that there used to be cottonwoods and a lot of wildlife. And, um, and the more I go places, the more I realize like, you know, how we really manipulate these natural spaces to make them fit into, so that they're more convenient for us, they're more contained. Um, and so even though this river has been altered and um, there have been, there's been a kind of, um, you know, there've been like flood control measures. There's still a sense of like, you know, there's something here that feels very much like, like it did and like it has for generations. Um, so you can still walk into the bosque and look up into a cottonwood and see a porcupine. Um, you know, you can kind of crouch down and turn over a rock and see um, like pill bugs, or you can, you know, if you're still enough, you can hear woodpeckers. And that is such a gift in a noisy life. Um, so I think I just wanted to, um, like much of this book is kind of remind all of us, like this, this is our resource here. It's like here for us and, um, and to encourage people to have a relationship with the bosque. So, and it's also easy to get to, so it doesn't require um, driving to the mountains or the volcano, it really is. Everyone come to the center. And to me, symbolically, it felt really meaningful to, to do something in the heart of the city. Um, so I've been through the bosque with like little kids on bikes, the story writers and, um, um, with, uh, you know, we had the, the light parade through there, <laughs> the Illuminarte for um, the holidays last year and um, the monthly poetry walks. So it's just, um, <clears throat> it's, it really is my place where I go when I need to kind of recenter. And, um, and it was just meaningful to me. 